in the long run, we are all dead. John Maynard Keynes said that in 1923 to warn economists against focusing too much on the market's ability to write itself. Sure, the economy will adjust itself over time, but in the short run, while economists are twiddling their thumbs, counting ceiling tiles, and memorizing all the lyrics to we didn't start the fire waiting for that to happen, people are going to starve, but we're not dead yet. Hi, I'm Matt Sofa, and this is Study Hall, Macroeconomics. Luckily for us, there are ways for the government to step in in the short run to make sure we're not all dead, and our morbid pal Keynes was a key thinker in this anti-economic death area. In his work, Keynes outlined the positive role governments could play in buffering their economies against boom and bust cycles. He believed that maybe the government's job is to protect people from the effects of the economic collapse he believed would come with unrestrained capitalism. That meant that maybe governments should jump in to help those people out of dire economic situations in the short run, or the time before markets can readjust. The idea was that governments should try to affect the economy through spending and taxation. Which brings us to, drumroll please, fiscal policy. In fiscal policy, the central lawmaking authority, like Congress in the US or the European Parliament, sometimes along with other branches of government, is in charge of regulating the economy and responsible for making sure its people aren't all dead before those market forces have time to do their thing. Generally, they use three fiscal policy tools, raising or lowering taxes, spending money on big new projects or cutting back, or just literally giving people money like with stimulus checks. The only thing certain is death, taxes, and some degree of government spending. <laughs> when talking about fiscal policy, we have to be careful not to confuse it with monetary policy, which also uses money to influence the economy. But that's done by central banks like the Fed, which operate semi-independently from the government. With fiscal policy, it's lawmakers who are trying to keep us alive, at least in the short run and influence parts of the economy, like the labor market or consumer spending, and therefore shift how much stuff people are buying in total, known as aggregate demand. Aggregate demand is highly sensitive to both price level and unemployment rate, meaning a shock to the market can really knock it out of whack and shift real GDP away from potential GDP. So fiscal policy's job is to try to move aggregate demand and get the economy back to its potential GDP faster than market forces can do on their own. A lot of the time, fiscal policy is reactive, meaning policymakers are reacting to current economic conditions rather than trying to predict and get ahead of what might be around the corner. If they see aggregate demand is too low and GDP is dipping, that means it's time for some expansionary fiscal policy. Expansionary fiscal policy is a kind of stabilization policy, meaning it's all about combating recessions by helping consumers and firms do their consumer thing, buying more stuff. Or in economic terms, increasing aggregate demand. But you can't buy any stuff if you don't have any money. So the government also wants people to be as employed as possible so that they have as much money to spend as possible which means job creation is a huge part of expansionary fiscal policy. If unemployment is high, Congress might choose to invest in some big projects that require lots of workers, like the Hoover Dam during the Great Depression in the 1930s, or more recently, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act in 2009 to combat the Great Recession, which focused on quickly actionable projects like energy infrastructure. But sometimes helping the economy is about cooling it down instead of heating it up. If the government sees that inflation is skyrocketing, they can use contractionary fiscal policy to slow things down. This includes things like raising taxes to decrease spending. If more of your money is going to pay for government services, you're gonna have less to spend on other stuff, decreasing aggregate demand. And lower demand means lower prices, which is what we're trying to encourage. Contractionary fiscal policy isn't all that common though, and the fight against inflation is usually left to the monetary policy of the Fed. That's because if you're an elected representative, at some point you're going to be up for re-election, and raising taxes isn't exactly the path to electoral success. Of course, lawmakers can't just snap their fingers and reset major economic forces. 
But both expansionary and contractionary fiscal policy are worth it because even small action can have an outsized impact as it spins through the economy, thanks to something called the fiscal multiplier. The fiscal multiplier determines the effect of an increase in government spending for fiscal policy projects on real GDP, positing that it can be bigger and more significant than the money spent by the government alone. That's because money invested in important projects turns into pay for employees, which should then become money spent on stuff, increasing consumption. It also becomes money for the firms hired to build the bridges, pave the roads, or brick the dams, giving them more to invest and increasing consumption even more. So, if everything works out, thanks to the multiplier effect, that original money spent by the government actually increases aggregate demand and spending by way more than just the amount the government dropped. The fiscal multiplier is based on a prediction of what consumers are probably going to save or spend when they get a little money in their pockets. For example, for every $100 someone gets, they might spend 75 bucks and save 25. In that case, the marginal propensity to consume is 0.75, and the marginal propensity to save is 0.25. We can use our MPC to find the fiscal multiplier by dividing 1 by 1 minus MPC. So say Congress invests in a $2 billion essential government undertaking to paint all fire hydrants chartreuse. If the marginal propensity to consume is 0.75 and the marginal propensity to save is 0.25, then the fiscal multiplier here is 1 divided by 0.25, or 4. So if Keynes is right, that means that the $2 billion project will have an outsized effect on our real GDP, increasing it four times as much as that original government spending. It probably seems as magical as bringing someone back from the dead. Well, right off the bat, the government spending those $2 billion boosts the government expenditures portion of our GDP equation. But that $2 billion goes right into the hands of firms like Hydrants R Us, who will invest it in their business through new purchases of green paint. Hydrants R Us and firms like it up the investment part of the GDP. But the money just keeps coming. Hydrants R Us pays wages to all the hydrant painters combing the country. If we're sticking with a marginal propensity to consume of 0.75, these workers will save 25% of what they earn and buy stuff with the rest, like chicken harnesses or garden gnomes or breakfast burritos. And the chicken harness seamstresses, garden gnome manufacturers, and burrito chefs can take that money and go on to buy more goods and services and on and on, all boosting the consumer expenditure portion of our GDP equation. So that initial $2 billion in government spending turns into investment expenditures from firms and extensive consumer expenditures, which can end up putting $8 billion into the economy shifting aggregate demand to the right, bringing the real GDP closer to its potential. Let's not get too excited, though. We live in the real world where nothing is certain, except our own mortality. There are a number of variables that even genius economists can't predict that affect the fiscal multiplier and keep it from, well, multiplying. One of the biggest issues with the fiscal multiplier is leakage. And I'm not talking about that gross or potentially hazardous goo dripping out of the roof of the subway or or that, that orange juice that you didn't cap tightly enough before you threw it in your tote bag. Economically, leakages are changes in spending that decrease the fiscal multiplier. Not all people are going to spend the same, obviously. So even if the trend is 75% consumption and 25% savings, the reality is that some people will save more of their money instead of putting it back into the economy. This is especially true if times have been tough recently. Plus, if the government decides to raise taxes to help fund the great fire hydrant repaint campaign, that means less disposable income for consumers to then put back into the economy, dampening that multiplying effect. Finally, this is gross domestic product we're talking about. So any money consumers spend on imports instead of domestic goods not only won't boost real GDP, but won't lead to other spending in the domestic economy. All of these factors can cause money to leak out of our great fiscal policy multiplier cycle, decreasing its effect. Aside from leakages, there's also the variable of inflation, which can reduce the fiscal multiplier. In fact, fiscal policy can sometimes unintentionally cause inflation. If GDP is flagging not because of unemployment, but thanks to a shock on the supply side of things, like a shortage, 
Fiscal policy can cause price levels to rise even more dramatically. Rather than boosting GDP, this can lead to rising prices for a bunch of stuff in the economy until basics like food and clothing aren't affordable for many consumers, even if there's demand. In these situations, inflation will decrease the purchasing power of firms and consumers' money, and therefore the power of that original government spending. And finally, some economists believe fiscal policy can also create something called crowding out. The government has to raise the funds for a big spending project in the first place, and one way they do that is through selling bonds in debt markets. But if households and firms are lending their money to the government, they might have less to loan out to private industries. That would mean those private firms would have less money flowing through them to their employees, lessening that multiplier effect. This kind of fiscal policy, where the government either tweaks taxes or chooses to fund a public project, is also called discretionary fiscal policy because it shifts at the discretion of the government. But it's only one type of fiscal policy, and it's not the supreme elixir of life. While discretionary fiscal policy can stabilize things quickly, it still takes time. New policies have to be researched, written, debated, and voted on. It could take years to get fiscal legislation through. And even after a project is approved, it takes a long time to get people actually on the job making money. Learning from these lags, Lawmakers created automatic stabilizers, or policies that are always there to fall back on without having to wait for all of the drama in Congress. Unemployment benefits are an example of an automatic stabilizer. Should unemployment rise, unemployment benefits will rise too, as payments are sent out to all those jobless folks who file. The country doesn't have to pass a new unemployment benefit law each time the economy contracts. Progressive taxation, where your tax rate increases along with your income, is another example of an automatic stabilizer. So if someone takes a pay cut or has reduced hours and their income goes down, they may end up with a lower tax rate to leave them with more spending money to put back into the economy and keep that demand up. The US, for example, has a progressive taxation system where people who make more money have to pay a higher tax rate than the people who make less, theoretically. Unless they're billionaires, of course. Other automatic stabilizers are benefits like welfare. Like unemployment benefits, these kick in automatically when people are in need. Welfare can include things like SNAP benefits, uh, supplemental security income, or programs like Head Start. The number of people who qualify for these benefits changes based on fluctuations in the economy, but they've always got your back. No additional legislation required. These automatic stabilizers help the economy from tipping too far into any recessionary holes. So if I'm stuck in a tough spot, I know our governmental policies are keeping me alive so I can focus on the real important things, spending money to support myself and the economy as a whole. The government uses fiscal policy to keep us alive. But don't get it twisted. What they're really concerned with is keeping the economy alive and burning bright. Because it's true, in the long run, individually, we are all dead. And sure, we didn't start the fire. It was always burning since the world's been turning. We didn't start the fire. No, we didn't light it, but we tried to fight it. Harry Truman, Doris Day, Red China, Johnny Ray, South Pacific, Walter Winchell, Joe DiMaggio. Joe McCarthy, Richard Nixon, Studebaker, Television, North Korea, South Korea, Marilyn Monroe. Rosenberg's H-bomb, Sugar Ray, Pan Munjom, Brando, the King and I, and the Catcher in the Rye, Eisenhower vaccine, England's got a new queen, Marciano Liberace, Santayana, goodbye, we didn't start the fire. It was always burning since the world's been turning. We didn't start the fire. No, we didn't light it, but we're trying to fight it. If you're enjoying this series and are interested in taking the full study hall macroeconomics course and earning college credit from ASU, check out gostudyhall.com or click on the button to learn more. And if you want to help us out, Give this video a like, uh, comment on potential new We Didn't Start the Fire verses, and smash that subscribe button. Thanks for watching. See you next time.